And I have to share this story. I think this is a good place. And interviewing for positions in student affairs has been complicated. So I'm on campus doing an interview back in the olden days when they were two day interviews and what, four or five meals, you know? <laughs> and the Dean of Students at this institution couldn't make, make the two days. The schedule was booked. So we met for a brunch on Sunday. And the Dean said to me, go ahead, have a mimosa. I'm going to drink, go ahead. And I said, no, thank you, I, no. She's, so she had one and I didn't. Go ahead, have one. Um, no, I really, I don't, I, you know, it's okay. I know you're not supposed to drink at interviews, but I'm gonna have one, have. So she did. Well, she got louder and louder and I'm a more uncomfortable because she's getting more, putting more pressure on me to have one. And I finally said, okay, I maybe should have said this earlier because now I'm going to say it and you're going to feel horrible and I don't want you to feel horrible. I'm a recovering alcoholic and she, this, this dean just went, oh my God. And she got real embarrassed and she stopped drinking. She hired me, so I'm okay with that. And, you know, but that was incredibly uncomfortable. And again, to Becky's point of, I was at that time almost 40. So I had other skills about speaking up and standing up for myself that a 25 year old might not have had. They might have drank at the interview thinking that that would be important in that moment. So imagine the, the dynamic. So, so when a person says, no, thank you, stop. Yeah. <laughs>
the uh, Director of Student Advocacy at Riverland Community College. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And um, my interest in this, my path to this work, um, I think it's, I was just getting ready for today and thinking about 31 years ago, I went to the college that, the community college that I work at now, five years into my recovery from alcohol. And now I have the opportunity at the school and in the town that I began my sobriety, sobriety life um, at. And um, I have the opportunity frequently to help students who are in a place that I was um, related to alcohol and drugs, but certainly related to I need to get back into school. I want to be back in school to improve my life for myself and my kids. And it's such a joy. And um, to be here with uh, my, my two colleagues that we worked on this, this monograph together and uh, with you, Heather, is such a treat, a great way to spend the afternoon. So thank you. Thanks so much, Penny. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Becky, I've known Becky for a long time, so it's great to see you. Um, it, is, it is great to see you too, Heather. Tell us a little bit about you, your pathway and interest. Thanks, I'm Becky Elkins. I am an associate professor in the Student Affairs Administration Program uh, at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, uh, where I've, I've been for five years. Uh, after a long student affairs higher ed, career in in various areas um and my pathway uh I, I too penny was thinking about the same same sort of topic and and thinking about how did i land here and in particular i was thinking about that because yesterday uh, i celebrated 23 years of sobriety from alcohol and drug use um and and I, the first time I attempted to get sober, uh, I was 19 years old and uh, a college student. Uh, and it was a student affairs professional who actually uh, intervened and, and, and suggested that might be uh, something to think about for me. And so it's always, to some extent, been this real interest uh, for me um, in, in terms of um, understanding what would have made my experience different. And, and so uh, as a faculty member, I've had the opportunity to conduct some research on college students in recovery. And um, yeah, so that's that's been my pathway. I think I forgot to say my pronouns. She, her, hers are my, awesome. my pronouns. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Erin, welcome. Hi, I'm Erin Hankey and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an assistant professor in counselor education at the University of Northern Iowa. However, prior to becoming a faculty member and working to train counselors, I worked for a number of years as a college counselor. And specifically, I worked in a, a medical school where I worked with uh, physicians, physician assistants and training, and got to see the, the real life struggles of students in, in working through mental health concerns in addressing substance use issues. And part of the passion came from folks who were in recovery and doing the work and seeing opportunities for advocacy that were really missed. Let me give an example. For mm -hmm. instance, when physicians need to apply for licensure post-graduation, they need to disclose mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, and so I would write letters of support or advocacy for the clients who I'd served. The challenge was I could have met with three students last week knowing that they may or may not have been clean or sober in terms of their educational journey and some of the stigma attached to folks who were doing the work of recovery and having that carry with them. So, um, so just seeing it from the, the counselor angle and then seeing it as an advocacy issue was really significant to me. Thank you so much. I love the mix of folks we have on this episode today. And I think we'll talk a little bit about how the team of authors came together, but I think you know, all of us are approaching this from different perspectives. And so I really appreciate you all being here. Um, but I want to start, I always, I kind of often start um, the podcast with let's talk about language, right? And you talk about this at the beginning of your, of the monograph that language is changing and language is contested and political. Um, and maybe Erin, you know, 
given your history with counselor education, um, can you talk a little bit about what is recovery and why is that the language, the current language of the field, maybe how it differs from other language that's been used or is still in use um, in the past, like addiction, sobriety, alcoholism, you know, all of those. So can you talk a little, what does I, recovery mean? <laughs> I'm going to, I'll start with some, some different ideas and then I'm going to look to Becky and, and Penny to jump in on this. One of the things that's been really significant about embracing the language of recovery is really looking at the whole person and, and really understanding that in people working on recovery, they're working on being healthy. They're working on being whole. They're working on their wellness. And so there's been a shift in thinking about what is the problem? What's problematic use? And how do we language and discuss maybe what it looks like to struggle as well as what it looks like to move through that struggle. And so for me, that language of recovery is about hope. It's about resilience. Um, it's about understanding that there are setbacks and missteps and that there are collective community invested in a process um, and, and giving people agency in that. So that's been really significant in terms of that language. I think that there's been some shifts away from addiction language, excuse me, <clears throat> into more of the substance abuse or, uh, and away from substance abuse language to substance use disorder. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about abuse and when we talk about addiction, we often begin to label folks and we begin to pathologize. And I think one of the first steps that we can take is think about what is the language conveying and how do we center on the human being because we are not the sum total of our struggles. And so I think that that's been a really significant um, shift in that language and, and thinking. And so that's kind of where I come from with that is moving toward, here's a clinical language. We could debate the politics of that. And how do we think about it in terms of affirmation and who these human beings are who are courageous and, and taking steps to get their education and, and do really good things in the world. Penny, Becky, you want to jump on that? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's amazing how that takes me back to early, early sobriety and early recovery when, when for me, um, identifying as a, an alcoholic in recovery was primary first, first thing I thought you needed to know about me. And after 31 years of that, it's like, yeah, you don't need to worry about that anymore, you know, but, but at the time, and I was 31 when I got sober, well, which now everybody knows how old I am. How about that? Um, um, that, that the, the language is powerful, but when a person is in, in trying to transform themselves and those weighted words that can, um, have so much meaning for other people, and, and, and then give people the belief that they have, they know everything that they need to know about you. Um, it can be limiting and it also can cause just too much, too much um, damage and, and backtracking. At a time when an individual has so much more um, to give, but also um, they're just, they're walking a line of, of perhaps not being able to recognize their strengths and also where they're, where they're um, needing help. So that language is incredibly powerful, both in a negative and in potentially powerful way, positive way. I think it's also really interesting though, when you think about it from an identity context, and we talk about this a little bit in, a, uh, in the monograph, but you know, I, th I think about my personal uh, way of thinking about my uh, recovery journey and, and I think this is, I think this is really important because if you're just a, you know, if you're just a person who's sitting and listening to people have conversations, it's important to recognize, am I speaking for myself or am I speaking sort of broadly? And, and so, and that's where in the, uh, you know, in the monograph, we do talk about language is politicized and, and it's, it's important, I believe for people to use the language that fits best for them. Um, I myself, I, I refer to myself to this day as an, as an alcoholic and addict. That is the language that I use. It feels like it's part of my identity, uh, but it feels like I came to that 
sort of over years of, of working. Whereas, you know, I was at a, a conference last year and a, um, a man stood up and, and, and he said, you know, I'm, I am, uh, this many years liberated from, uh, alcohol and drugs. And, and throughout the conference, I had encountered him a number of times. And, th and that was really important to him, that notion of, I am a liberated person. And so that was part of his identity in ways that's different from, from mine. And so I think that's where it gets complicated, right? Because the language that we use also is attached to the ways in which we think about our own identities. And, and so, um, you know, when, when I'm talking on the one hand, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say, a person with a substance use disorder that feels clunky to me and it feels inauthentic to me right and yet when I talk to students today that's in many ways the language that they they use and so I think it's really important to attend to as we do with other arenas of identity to really attend to what's the language that is being used by the individuals where the po power and and conflict sources in the language that we we use and, and what does it communicate or not communicate about um, both individuals and our capacity to help individuals. Yeah. Becky, can I jump in a little bit on that too? And this might take us in a, a slightly different direction, but sticks with the, the language piece. When we train student affairs professionals or when we train counselors, I, I think it's really important to listen and hear and use the language that people use for themselves at the same time, I also think it's really important that in our training programs, we work to help um, our clinicians, our student affairs professionals to think about people first. And again, there's a lot of debate in this, but in some ways, I think the way that we language becomes the way that we think and what we believe. And so, yeah. and so that's been that challenge. Becky, and I have had these conversations about okay, when I'm training somebody, I'm training in person first language, and it's really important for them to also hear and allow people to be able to speak to that. And so we've had some of those pieces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I personally, I really like the word recovery also. And you speak mm -hmm. about this a bit in the monograph about it's, it feels, feels optimistic and, and also early. And so can one of you maybe speak just a, a, a bit off, off of our list of questions about the stages of recovery? Because I think that's the other piece that like when we're engaging with college students who might be in that um, early recovery moment, you know, that might, you know, surround a different set of needs than when students are farther into sobriety. Um, I don't know. The stages was an interesting kind of other piece to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I I love the I love thinking about the stages of recovery because I think it um, it gives us opportunity to sort of hit on and address different different dimensions of what um, students on the one hand might be needing, but on the other hand also what they might be bringing to the table in in those contexts. And I so you, know, you sort of think about uh, early sobriety as less than a year of sobriety. And we talk about a lot about, you know, this is a, this is a moment, um, Aaron, you probably all know all this better. Than, <laughs> I'm just talking away. You probably know this better, but this is a moment where, um, you know, folks are trying to get a little, I mean, they're trying to get stabilized. They might be trying to find housing. They're probably trying to find uh, new friends potentially, or figuring out how do I, uh, how do I navigate my finances? How do I navigate um, going through these things that I have used drugs or alcohol to help me get through before, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I used a lot as a student. And so using connected to classes and studying was, was a big thing for me. Uh, and so how do I do that? And that, that is happening generally within that, within that first year, it's sort of everything that, you know, how do I go through the holidays? How do I, you know, all of those sleep? pieces. How do I sleep? Oh, sleep is a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do I sleep? Mm -hmm. um, 
and then you then you sort of move into that stabilizing period where you have uh, wh where you have um, more stable recovery. I think they say less than five years. I think so that one to five year time range where where you're not really in crisis mode of trying to trying to sort of turn your life upside down, but you're still early in recovery. So you're still navigating uh, relationships and how to do, you might, you know, how do I date or how do I, um, you know, how do I talk in social settings if I'm not using? Um, and so these are more the, you know, maybe I get my first job and what does that look like if mm. I'm, if I'm not using it? So it's, it's more, it's much more stable than that first year of recovery, but it still has, uh, I think some, some challenges at the same time, I find folks in that one to five year time frame are the most exuberant about uh, recovery. And in some ways, wow, what they bring to the table is really energizing. And, um, uh, you know, it can be great for folks who are trying to figure out how to stabilize uh, their lives. And so there's a lot of positive energy, I think, in that, in that um, uh, stable that initial stable recovery period and then you have folks who move into long-term recovery i'm thinking at that point you know for me I, I hardly ever think about drugs and alcohol today from a perspective of wanting to use them right um i'm able to have these conversations i could not have had this conversation in the first year of my sobriety at all mm. um and so uh you know these are folks that have sort of moved into uh a, a, significantly more stable, uh, recovery and, you know, they're sort of just navigating life and then also looking for what are the ways in which I, for, for many folks, not everyone, but what are the ways in which I contribute to community? Um, that's how I would sort of see those, those clusters. I, I don't know, Penny, Aaron, if you would agree with that. And all, and then all of that has to be negotiated with the different in the different arenas that that person is. Right. So campus, family, employment, high school friends, you know, so, um, and then also just building that, that the circles of trust and the circles of not just others, but myself that I can do this and um, test on the water, rinse, wash and repeat. Wind, <laughs> wash mm -hmm. and repeat, yeah. yeah. Well, Penny, and I imagine. Talked, oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Erin. I was going to no, say, Penny. and Heather, Penny, you've talked a little bit too about the importance of that recovery capital and mm -hmm. helping folks to build that recovery capital. And and so the building blocks might be a little bit different, or the needs might be a little bit different depending on where people are in their process. And there is a need regardless of where people are. So that's been really um, important. An important takeaway. Um, Becky, in some of the research you're doing, there have been some really interesting findings surfacing where um, students who are early in recovery are using some of the recovery skills and tools in order to navigate some of the initial academic challenges and, and creating that. And then it's also been interesting to uh, read about and observe some of, of your participants who have long-term sobriety and how they have really um, drawn on everything that they have done in different arenas, Penny, like you're speaking of, and then, okay, this is a new arena. So what does it mean to be in a new arena here while having stability in these other areas? So just some fascinating concepts and opportunities for us to be supportive and listen and think through how can we be there for students? I think this is fascinating. And I, um, I also imagine as we think about students in transition, you know, in, into and, and through different arenas, right? So graduation, first job, you know, like anticipating how some of those transition moments or moving off campus, right? So like, what does that transition moment look like and how do they continue to gather skills and, and abilities to, to address? Um, 
That's that's fascinating. So I want to switch gears just a moment and talk about the monograph. Um, it is available for folks uh, on their library's websites if your school has a has a subscription or you can purchase it from Wiley. Um, the the um, monograph is called College Students in Recovery and Creating Space for Student Success. Um, which I really appreciate this, the tie to student success because um, I think what's important is that it, similar to the word recovery, it, it, it um, connotates this kind of positive, you can move to that place of being successful. Um, but Becky, I'd love to hear, like, how did you, how did this come together? Um, tell me a little bit about the team of authors besides the, besides the three of you who contributed um, and then we'll get to kind of what what do you hope for this to be out in the world? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so I, I think we start the the editor's notes by saying this monograph was thirty years uh, or twenty over twenty years in the making, uh, uh, maybe twenty three to be exact. Uh, so what's um, I think lovely about this moment and for me about the monograph is that. Uh, uh, Penny and I were working together in an office uh, in Texas A&M when I was uh, first uh, trying to get sober uh, for real, not as a college student anymore. And, um, you know, our so our recovery journeys crossed paths and we've moved on and done lots of different things over the years. And a number of years ago, I had an experience at a, a national conference that sort of presumed uh, uh, drinking that was in the culture of the, of the conference. And I called Penny to talk about it. So we we're having this great conversation and it led us to a discussion of, can you imagine, you know, this is what it's like for me in my, uh, you know, late thirties to have this experience. Can you imagine what it's like for a college student to be trying to navigate sobriety, early, early sobriety, early recovery. And that led to um, some early discussions about, we should write about that. We should, we should really think more about, you know, how, how we could help student affairs professionals better understand the experiences in particular of college students, students in recovery. So you know, we had a lot of brainstorming chats and a number of years passed. And as a new faculty member, uh, I, I received a, a grant to do some research on college students in recovery. And that rekindled, uh, you know, I learned some new things and that rekindled these conversations uh, with Penny. And so we, um, we went back, revisited that conversation. And um, <laughs> I... I guess I'm just bold and and just went up to some people who had presented at uh, conferences and said, we're thinking about doing this monograph. We'd love to have you write with us. And, um, you know, those folks led us to other folks who are prominent in the um, collegiate recovery field. So sort of a nuance. I, I think of it as sort of uh, it's it's often under the umbrella of student affairs, but to some extent it's it's somewhat adjacent. You also have public health folks, you have um, uh, psychologists, counselors, lots of lots of folks in that arena. And so we just started asking folks and we did some did some research and and looking at uh, who are these collegiate recovery programs, where are they housed and and just went out and did some cold calls to ask if folks would be willing to write with us. And to our surprise, they said yes. Uh, so okay. that's that's the team, of, particularly the chapters that focus on the on the um, the specific CRPs. And then uh, Penny and I both knew some colleagues that were doing either work on on writing on identity or writing on um, also collegiate recovery, um, college students in recovery and their experiences. So we just kind of clustered this group together and and it it took off um, from there. And, and I what I love about it is something that you mentioned earlier, Heather, which is it's a broad range of folks. Not everybody's in mm -hmm. student affairs. Um, a lot of times 
college counseling is housed in student affairs, but they're not necessarily seeing themselves, seeing themselves working more as collegiate recovery slightly, mm -hmm. like I said, a little adjacent. So I love it. Yeah. It's well, great. now that it's out in the world and available, Penny, talk a little bit about, you know, who do you anticipate reading, using this book um, and monograph, I guess it technically is. And what outcomes do you hope come from this being out in the world and available for our student services, student affairs um, communities? There are so many um, misperceptions about students with alcohol and drug issues. Um, so I think the first primary audience for this, this monograph are, are professionals in higher education. So the people, that know students, that work with students. And I say people because it could be faculty, it could be student affairs. It could be a janitor in the res halls, you know, that is seeing um, behaviors that are, that might create a concern. And, um, and then, you know, educating them on the, um, you know, understanding that the individual isn't broken, the individual needs help. And what one in, what one person can do to help, you know, if somebody happens to say to you one day, and then I have this thing with alcohol, and mm -hmm. which is what Becky said to me one day, and I went, no, let's go back and talk more about that. What is this thing with alcohol, and um, and then how to how to approach, how to engage and care for? It's not complicated. It's humanistic, and. And um, so that would be the that would be the primary, you know, is the the individuals on campus. I think parents reading this could be incredibly um, useful to parents' understanding. Just the um, the uh, all of the the triggers, the all all of the um, I can't remember the word, the term in the in the it's a hot it's a what's the what's the term for what a campus is? It's so supportive of alcohol and drug consumption. It is a hostile environment to being sober. I can't remember. It's abstinence hostile. Thank, thank you. There thank you. Go. you. Oh, that's so good. collectively, we do have a good brain. <laughs> so, so, so that parents can understand what their what their um, child, the student, is struggling with and or celebrating um, on campus as they both try to um, remain sober and also uh, gain an education and get ready for the rest of their life. So it's a number of different people. I could could an individual, a student, read this and find um, resources and information. You bet. And that what would be delightful about that is if they did find the system or the the the, the systemic aspects that would be helpful to them individually, and then they went to a student affairs professional or a dean of students or a vice president of student affairs and said, "Could you do this here, please? Because this would really help me." Um, and so it's. Um, it's approachable to almost anyone that has a, a um, an interest and, and, and tell me who that wouldn't be, right? Because this is about caring for the, all of the humans and particularly this, this um, aspects of humanity that tends to be forgotten or it, that it is such a, 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 an issue that people don't want to look at because maybe they have to look at themselves in that. So, yeah. That's kind of that's kind of who we thought. You know, some of my experiences in, and I have to share this story. I think this is a good place. In interviewing for positions in student affairs, has been complicated. So I'm on campus doing an interview back in the olden days when they were two day interviews and what <laughs> four or five meals, you know, and the dean of students at this institution couldn't make make the two days. The schedule was booked, so we met for a brunch on Sunday. And the Dean said to me, go ahead, have a mimosa. I'm going to drink, go ahead. And I said, no, thank you, I, no. She's, so she had one and I didn't. Go ahead, have one. Um, no, I really, I don't, I, you know, it's okay. I know you're not supposed to drink in interviews, but I'm gonna have one, have, so she did. Well, she got louder and louder and I'm a more uncomfortable because she's getting more, putting more pressure on me to have one. And I finally said, okay, I maybe should have said this earlier because now I'm going to say it and you're going to feel horrible and I don't want you to feel horrible. 
I'm a recovering alcoholic. And she, this, this dean just went, oh my God. And she got real embarrassed and she stopped drinking. That she hired me. So I'm okay with that. And, you know, but that was incredibly uncomfortable. And again, to Becky's point of, I was at that time almost 40. So I had other skills about speaking up and standing up for myself that a 25 year old might not have had. They might have drank at the interview thinking that that would be important in that moment. So imagine the, the dynamic. So, so when a person says, no, thank you, stop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. That, that's a really powerful story. And also I think, you know, calls a bit into question how our, and Becky referred to a conference. I was at that same exact summer mm-hmm. meeting and remember this quite well, um, how our field is really in, integrated in a, an alcohol use mindset, mm-hmm. which is problematic. And in, in the cases that you talk about and in the case of our professional development and um, oh my gosh, so much we could talk about there for sure. Um, I do want to uh, jump for for following along I'm going to jump to question seven because I am curious about the the publication of this monograph coming out in the middle of a pandemic and there was a lot of media attention I think there still is on the uptick in drinking specifically right during the pandemic as a coping mechanism or because people don't have other things to do I don't I don't know all those um, components there, but could Aaron, could you talk a little bit about how this reflected or was reflected within college student populations? And I'm thinking also specifically about college students who are not on campus, right? Who are studying from their homes and Penny mentioned that an audience could be parents, right? Like how, how do students in recovery kind of navigate uh, maintaining and also addressing this like very stressful event that we're all still in the middle of kind of. And I think Heather, you're, you're touching on it there that, that it's evolving. It's evolving, you know, week to week, sometimes moment to moment for folks. And um, I, there are lots of conversations happening on a professional level, as well as informally with students about how do we navigate this? And that's a question that continues to come up. So we've been working, on different ways to think about how do we connect and how do we form community and how do we bridge this this distance whether it's that that across zoom distance or (laughs) or other sorts of um challenges because um a huge part of the recovery process is having that community and and so what we've seen is we've seen people really um, kind of coalesce around support services. We've seen um, increasing access via Zoom meetings or just kind of informal networking or students really showing resilience and checking in with each other. So those are some of the positive things that this has afforded uh, creativity of how do we connect? And you know what? Connection might not mean just in my residence hall right now. It might mean hopping on a meeting that has been going on, you know, every hour on the hour, but this might be a whole collection of folks across the country coming together. So there's that positive. I think, Heather, what you're speaking to is also the challenges. Mm -hmm. Increased isolation, um, increases in in terms of, of trauma and stress, going back into dynamics or situations that may have on some level contributed to using in the first place. And so that's where we're seeing a lot of the challenges. And and so how do we navigate some of those pieces? How do we enhance our outreach efforts? Also, how do we, what does navigational capital or recovery capital look like in this context? And we're trying to prepare for fall and what does that look like? You know, we're gonna have students who are grieving a number of losses. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to have students that are elevated into living in kind of constant threat state survival mode and what does that mean? Um, And I'm not sure that we have solid answers yet, but here's where I'm gonna defer to my colleagues a little bit that we've got positive things happening in terms of people being creative and coming together. And then we have these exacerbated risk factors and challenges. Penny, Becky, what are your thoughts on where we go? Or what have you seen on your campuses? 
So I'll, I'll just jump in quickly to say, um, I, I think certainly, uh, certainly the risk factors that you identified, Aaron, are, are, are huge. Um, I think, I think you layer into that uh, other identities, and that becomes even more um, complex. So uh, I worry a lot about what is happening for our trans students today, mm -hmm. and in particular, um, our, our I think about our trans students of color who uh, are trying to navigate substance use disorders and mm -hmm. and are potentially back in contexts that uh, are not are not affirming for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I think a lot about who uh, the specific students are that I might know and where they might be and wh what does that look like then on a, a larger um, a larger scale of sort of our subpopulations of students um, and what those risk factors are. I gotta tell you though, I'm looking to the fall and I'm thinking, I'm sort of thinking we ain't seen nothing yet because uh, I think that if you think about sort of our alcohol culture, our drinking culture, and increasingly our drug use culture, um, it, you know, that um, if we are back sort of fully on campus, for many of us have not been there, but we have all of our students back on campus in the fall and folks are vaccinated and bars are open. And uh, I think that we're, I think we're gonna see uh, sort of a boom in that culture from even what we have now. Uh, and then I think that opens the doorway to uh, some other potential problems. And, and I'll just name one of them really quickly. Uh, in the research that I've done, folks in early recovery will tell you that the worst times of their recovery experiences are the 10 minutes before and the 10 minutes after class, right? Where they're in class, they're heading to class, and there's this rapport building chit chat that is going on that is often, often focused on what you do this weekend or what do you, it's Friday afternoon, where are you heading? What are you drinking? What are you doing? And so even their classroom, which they perceive as it should be a safe space is not that for them. It's, there, it's fraught with, with challenges to their recovery, especially for folks early, mm. early on. I think if we see a boom in our, in our alcohol and drug use culture in the fall, uh, I, think, I think that's gonna be even more complicated for, for students walking into those, those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, you really hit on something I think that's that we're hearing a lot of with regard to, um, you know, students feeling like they missed the traditional first year experience, right? Yep. So making up for last time, lost time and students who chose to come to camp, even though the residence halls weren't open, chose to come to East Lansing anyway, um, because they didn't want to miss out, right? So in, without all of the supports of the residence hall environment. And I, so yeah, I think you've hit on some really interesting um, things to, for us and our listeners to kind of be aware of and cautious of as we move into what fall is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna shift back to talking a little bit and you mentioned this around the complexity of identity and you know how for, for all folks, right? Across layers of identity, um, experiences take on different meaning potentially based on positionality. Um, and there has been some critique, right, in the literature about the recovery movement being an all white space, right, where recovery for some folks and for white folks is the hero's journey. Um, but for our Bi BIPOC individuals, there are different kinds of consequences of stating I'm in recovery. Um, and we're all white women here, so we're, we're opening up this conversation, you know, from our own lenses, of course, but um, Becky, can you talk a little bit about how we can also think about the disproportionate impact and some of those larger equity issues around social justice and around identity that we might need to be paying attention to if we're going to truly serve students in recovery? Sure. Uh, I think that's a, I think it's, a phenomenal question, Heather. I think it's 
to me, it's a central question uh, uh, that we uh, that we ought to be wrestling with. Uh, I think, you know, if I if I sort of think about um, where I begin with this question, um, it, it's I think we it's essential that we have to recognize that our histories, both the higher education community. Um, and the recovery movement, our, our histories are, are grounded in systems of white supremacy. And I, I think, you know, if we're truly going to address this, we cannot shy away from uh, recognizing that fact. And, and in particular, I think about uh, Lori Patton's work and the, and the, the, the propositions of, you know, what does it mean for uh, us to acknowledge that our histories are are rooted in white supremacy. What does it what does it mean for us to understand that our knowledge structures are rooted in white supremacy? And I think about that in the context even of the language conversation that we're having. Right, that that is all. Uh, you know, if you you sort of step back from it, um, and I will this will this will in many corners cause. Um, uh, cause disgruntlement uh, and 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 disagreement, uh, but AA. You think about AA. No matter how benevolent you might think AA is, it's still a program that was created by white Christian men for white Christian men. That has implications for mm -hmm. the entire recovery movement and and how we think about that today. It's rare that you go to a treatment program that doesn't require you to use some sort of 12 step program in the process. And even though AA itself isn't pushing that, it's difficult to find a treatment program uh, that doesn't in some ways incorporate that. So, so our knowledge structures, how we think about that. If you wanna uh, you know, think about history of higher ed, um, you know, same sorts of things in terms of our regeneration of knowledge. The, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous hasn't been rewritten since the early 19 or the, the, the mid 1930s. And so it still uses, uh, right. It still wow. uses he language and him language to, uh, you know, it's very sexist. It's, there's, there's, very little mention of the experiences at all of folks of color. Uh, it's so it's, it's, you know, you walk into an AA meeting and that's the first thing that's handed to you. Mm. And, um, and so it's not surprising to me that in that sense, um, you know, we don't, we don't find lots of, lots of folks of color uh, using uh, AA, for instance, mm -hmm. um, but it also speaks then to why our treatment centers are not very adept at working with folks of color. And then you see that the, the effects of all of that then on our campuses. So I think I think we have to start there. We have to we have to start by really wrestling with that issue. I think we have to recognize that the language then that we use is not encompassing. So when I say recovery, and I you know I I, I found this out by by you know, putting up signs and inviting people to participate in a study on college students in recovery. And I got a wonderful group of lovely white folks uh, because that language resonates for them and it doesn't resonate for, for many of our BIPOC folks. And so how do we shift uh, our, even our research or our thinking or, or even our collegiate recovery program requirements, right? So we, we shift our language or open our language so that it's, it's much more inclusive. I think we have to ask ourselves really critical questions. We have to ask the question, who isn't here and why aren't they here? So if we're sitting on our campus and we're talking about folks in recovery and we're talking about students in recovery and I see an all white population of students, I, I better be asking myself about where are the students of color? And are students of color in recovery on our campus? Do they not identify in that way? Or do they simply identify collegiate recovery spaces as white spaces? And then what do we do about that? 
how are our policies excluding students of color? I think oftentimes, uh, you know, we have to wrestle with, with, you know, as student affairs professionals, we have assumptions about who does, who's deserving of second chances. And these yes. are folks a lot of times who need second chances. You know, do we have grade forgiveness policies mm -hmm. that allow folks uh, entry into, into our campuses? Uh, what are our disciplinary practices? All of those things I think we have to, we have to think about and wrestle with. And then, uh, you know, I think finally for me, uh, really drawing on the principles of the strategic imperative for racial justice mm -hmm. and decolonization from, from ACPA. My, uh, I think we have to, you know, we have to in some ways really figure out how do we build authentic collaborative relationships with our colleagues who are in recovery and particularly our colleagues of color who are in recovery and that that is, uh, that is, that is a starting point. We have to do that as professionals. And if we're not willing to do it as professionals, we're certainly not gonna do it with students. Uh, and then I think uh, my colleague Ting Wong talks about the, the surge D in clusters, right? Mm -hmm. So one cluster being about being honest and open-minded, one cluster about centering relationships and community, and then one cluster about agency and really empowering both ourselves and our students. And then the last thing I'll say is research, research, research. We do mm. not know enough. We absolutely do not know enough about the experiences of college students of color in recovery. Thank you so much, Becky. That was um, that was exactly where I was hoping we'd go with that question because I do think it's a really complex, um, you know, and, and to, to not address it feels like we're just you know, assuming everybody's experience is the same, which is the basis of white supremacy, right? Um, and I think it calls into question the ways all of the topics that we discuss on student affairs now intersect with, with other aspects of identity. Um, we can't just talk about, you know, majority student experiences white student experiences, um, likely. Let's let's switch to talking a bit about some of these better practices though, because I am optimistic. And this monograph made me feel really optimistic that our campuses are starting to figure out some better practices that um, better serve students, you know, leads towards student success. Um, and so Penny, can you talk a little bit about you know, in general, what are some better practices that campuses and those who are listening today might be able to you know, push towards? Um, providing uh, students in recovery um, opportunities to cross paths with other students in recovery. So be that in housing, uh, in particular in housing, you know, having, having um, substance free um, housing options for everybody, but in particular, making sure that there's enough space for students who uh, uh, wish to remain and, and um, enhance their, their, their sobriety and their recovery. Um, that benefits all, all students. You know, um, you know the, the social, um, I'm having such a bad brain day today. The, um, I can't remember, you know, one in six students don't say they drink or you know the yeah the normative kind of campaigns thank you. Thank yes yes thank you. yeah um and it, you ask students and everybody drinks well really they don't but but that's what you see and that's what you hear and that's what's in the news and most students would rather go to school and do well in school and celebrate but not where they live and um and so crossing paths with individuals having um staff readily available to provide those answers to those questions that they have um, about um, academics, about career paths um, with, with the identity that they're walking with today. Um, um, so, uh, and 24 seven access to meetings. There's something that, 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 that the media does not portray very well that happens magically in a group of individuals sitting together and supporting each other. And if you have to go off campus to find that connection, what you're missing is students in higher education in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, Becky and I have attended a few meetings that we could have walked away and just gone right straight to the bar because of what that felt like in that, in that meeting. And so you've got to have 
um, peer, um, you gotta have uh, peer connection, professional access, um, and then the, the meetings and the, and the recovery program um, and the, the insulation as well as isolation uh, to the rest of the campus. Anything else that you would add, Becky or Erin? I've got a, I, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, Penny, is, is early alerts and how we approach mm -hmm. early alerts or checking in, whether you're in an academic advising role or you're in the residence hall, how are we asking? Um, questions and checking in how are people doing, making sure that we're asking about substance use just as a matter of practice. Um, another thought is that we have a whole range of possibilities from prevention to intervention. And I think what I've learned from my colleagues is there are multiple points of entry. Um, and so what can we be doing on the front end? That's one. And another piece is what can we do with our conduct policies? How are we thinking about those pieces um, and our responses that way? And who are we missing? You know, we've had students uh, that just stop showing up to class, you know, and in what mm -hmm. way are they, they're not on the conduct radar, but they, they have those concerns. Um, final thing I'll say on this is campus resources are tight. We understand that collaboration seem to be really essential. So if there are great community programs, agencies, if there are things that campuses are doing that are in a general vicinity, are there ways to collaborate and build networks that way? Um, and, and I think that that's a, we've seen some real success in that. That's great. I think one quick thing I would add um, is if you read the monograph, uh, one of the take one of the things you may come away with is there are these sort of three programs that we highlight in the monograph, and and they are all collegiate recovery programs, and you know it's important I think for us to be really honest about the fact that less than five percent of institutions of higher education have these programs. So what can we take from those programs that we can do what? Aaron just talked about in terms of collaborating with one another. Uh, so we don't have to take the whole program, but can we take pieces of it? Are there, are there elements that are happening in those programs, uh, particularly in today, today's resource uh, short, shall I say, world? Uh, I think that's really, that's really important to recognize there are very few campuses with these kinds of programs, and we have Literally, I think in 2017 study about uh, what we say one in ten uh, uh, students, college students with a with a, a diagnosable substance use disorder. So uh, that's a that's a, a a fair amount of our of our populations that we we could be doing short of having full full on collegiate recovery programs. Yeah. Yeah, I said before we started um, recording that as I was reading through and prepping for today, I was like, what is MSU doing? And again, I am on a giant campus. It's very dispersed in terms of what is student affairs, um, but was pleased to pleased to find as, as I Googled, right, um, more information. So I'm like, and how is it that I did not know this before, right? I mean, this is our all of our responsibility um, to know what resources exist on our campuses. Um, and I did really particularly like the exemplars that you pointed out in the monograph so that folks will have some good models to look at. Um, as we always do, we run short on time. This has been a fabulous conversation. I so appreciate um, the three of you and all that you brought to today. Um, and as we also always end on Student Affairs Now, this podcast is called Student Affairs Now. Um, what are you thinking about pondering, troubling, you know, where is your, where is your mind going now? Um, and I'll go to Penny first. So recently Riverland Community College, which has a, a total of 4,500 students, so much different than Texas A&M or Michigan State. Um, we moved, we shifted our counseling services office to advocacy services because um, there were no licensed counselors in the office and um, student needs had shifted. We contracted with the community to provide mental health services that Riverland pays for, for students that, that would like that. Um, 
but we're hiring a social worker, bringing a, a social worker and an, an, uh, a second uh, staff in, in the office. And so the advocacy and support that's happening is, this is the best job I've ever had because you never know, you never know what's coming in the door. And um, the, so what I'm thinking about future is that um, even for, I think frequently if we built student affairs today, it wouldn't look like this. Mm-hmm. And so as much as we can uh, do the restructure um, uh, and, and redirect of, of resources to meet the needs of that one out of 10 students in higher education and, and how many of those also have mental health and um, um, learning disabilities and, you know, um, and on and on. Uh, what I'm thinking about is um, doing more with more. Mm-hmm. Can, we start, can we start that way? <laughs> instead, of a, instead of this mindset of scarcity, right? I, yes. uh, oh. yes. Because that, because the resources are there. Can we just shift them? Yeah. And so Absolutely. maybe we could do more with more. And um, always, you know, the, the, the bulk of us can do more if we do it together um, and, and, and to be more successful. Um, it is, uh, I, am, I am hopeful. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back to normal. I want to go back to better than normal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, I, so, because it feels like so much finally broke open, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not broke because it was broke, but it broke open to a place that we now can say, but what do we, what do we need that to be? Yeah. And I, I know that's very vague and that's, yeah, that's no, I, I think you bring up a really good point. And there's a there's another episode of Student Affairs Now where Keith talks to three folks about what do we need to restore um, back to the way it was? What needs to evolve? And then what needs to completely transform after the pandemic? And it's based on an Educause article, which talks about it specifically through the lens of technology. But um, the three who spoke about this in the podcast, just, I think, really um so i what you're saying really resonates with me penny because i think we have a lot of um opportunity now so we can look at it as that mm-hmm. um aaron what are you thinking about pondering troubling i'm like i'm the pre-tenure faculty member here so i'm thinking <laughs> about research <laughs> um so heather when you were talking about learning what's available and accessible on your campus. I think like a starting point is what are our resources? Who's already at the table? And then how do we invite other people in? And and I've seen, and I'm I'm guilty of this too, like reinventing the wheel or trying to, when we're we're envisioning what comes out of broken, um, we don't want to have the same voices at the table either. You know, we, we've got to think about that. And are there different ways to collaborate? And I'm, I'm in a training position now, you know, are there ways that graduate students and student affairs and, and counseling graduate students can be resources on campus in some ways in terms of, of promoting this resiliency and creating safe spaces? And um, so I'm thinking about that. Communication, that. collaboration. And then Becky, we need to take that next step with the research. (laughs) Becky, what are you thinking about pondering, troubling? Not that last point. Uh, So, (laughs) so, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been talking, I think for, for a bit this spring about this question, does sober mean white? Mm -hmm. And um, that is the question that's really troubling me at the moment, and I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, it's it's troubling me on a professional level. It's really troubling me on a on a personal level and my my own uh, sort of personal recovery efforts. And so, trying to figure out how do we, um, you know, how how do we create a more inclusive approach to. Um, it, it, and it doesn't have to be the the word recovery. Whatever whatever this magical thing is that uh, uh, allows life to be better for folks, um, you know, can we can we find a way to be more inclusive in our approach to that? And 
you know, as an educator uh, and, and a person who works in a, a graduate prep program, uh, I think a lot about how are these conversations getting to our, mm. uh, uh, particularly our master's students who are coming out uh, and are going to be our, our new professionals and our future of the field. And how are we getting them to our doctoral students who are going to be uh, sooner uh, the folks doing our research, the folks leading our scholarship, uh, the folks making decisions at senior level uh, capacities, and, and how do we get these conversations happening in those spaces? So I think those are the things that are yeah, the, thank in my you head, for, head a little bit. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I, I do think there's um, some actions to be taken, you know, and particularly who gets invited to the conversation at the table. Um, and master students have a voice, right, too. Yes. So I love that. Yes. Um, I am so grateful to all of you. Thank you so much for being on Student Affairs Now. Um, also, thanks to our sponsors for today's episode, Leadership and EverFi. We so deeply appreciate your support. Um, huge shout out to Natalie Ambrosi, our production assistant for the podcast, who does all the behind the scenes work to make us look and sound good. Um, if you are listening today and you're not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please do visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. And while you're there, you can, of course, check out all of our archived. Um, now we're at 43, I think, um, episodes. So as you listen today, if you found this content useful, please do share it within your networks. Um, my name is Heather Shea. Thanks again to the fabulous guests and to everyone watching and listening. Make it a great week, everyone.